Uh, now, we've been privileged, actually, over the last few years to be helped through all the big stories in the United States by our next guest. I would call him our man in North America, except we don't pay him anything. He does it all out of love for the transatlantic understanding and uh, the amity of our two peoples divided by a common language, as uh, the great Oscar Wilde once said. And he joins us again. Tonight, he's a former U.S. Con congressman, of course, now a pundit, John Leboutillier. John, thanks very much again for joining us. George, you have no idea what a pleasure it is for me always to talk to you. I love you. I love sport talk, talking on the radio to England. It's a treat and a privilege for me. I don't need to be paid. No, I, we're, I but we're, we're yeah. very lucky because uh, not only have you got one of the best voices on radio, you've got one of the best minds in U.S. Uh, politics, and uh, I'm sure the Congress is poorer for you not being there. However, it does allow you to sit up there in the crow's nest, as it were, and, and look down on, uh, on events and, and bring us the benefit of your uh, analysis on that. Let me ask you first, if I may, about the way in which the political class, at least, is viewing the events in the Middle East, where um, former clients of the United States uh, are being toppled from their... Uh, thrones and from their presidential palaces. How is it going down? Is there any soul-searching going on in the U.S. about it? Well, I mean, I, 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 I think there's a lot of mixture about it. I mean, in policy-making circles in Washington is one thing, where they know, for instance, that Mubarak for America was a good ally for the United States, a reliable guy who kept the peace with Israel and fought terrorism. That's from the policy point of view. But the, the people of America, I'm sure it's the same in England, watching every minute on TV the last few weeks from Cairo live with tremendous coverage. I mean, the American people love seeing the Egyptian people trying to get the same thing we have here and you have there. Freedom, democracy, voting, speaking out, freedom of assembly, all that stuff we all take for granted they want it and they're going to hopefully they're going to get it and uh, that was the big story people love seeing it what about the fact that it's partly driven the huge increase in the in the oil price it's 103 or 104 dollars today could go could go even higher than the all-time high which was 147 dollars per barrel uh, a few years back will that change if the Prices at the pump start skyrocketing in America? Well, it, it'll certainly have an effect. You know, one thing about that is I think most Americans now believe any excuse these oil companies can come up with to raise the price. Yeah, that's doing. a good point, yeah. I mean, you know, the Hurricane Katrina happened, and the first night of the hurricane, which was in the Gulf of Mexico, obviously, um, uh, the prices went up overnight. How, how can they go up overnight? Well, because... They use it as an excuse. It yeah. couldn't actually be that the oil rigs hadn't even been shut down yet, <laughs> <coughs> and already the price has gone up. Absolutely. So it's right. any excuse. And, and now tell me this. Like tell it. me this, John. Yeah. Um, the economic situation in the United States still not really off the floor. Nine percent unemployment and a budget now that knocks a fantastic amount of money out of the uh, public expenditure, presumably leading to more. Unemployment. How is this all affecting President Obama's standing in the polls? Well, you know, it's a fascinating thing. Obama's ratings have gone up in the last two months, surprisingly, since the, uh, as he put it, the shellacking in the midterm election on November 2nd. He, he was down then. The Democrats were down. But when he made this deal with the, De with the Republicans to extend the Bush tax cuts for everybody, after he had always said he wouldn't do it, he did a complete reversal, made a deal with Republicans. The deal was very popular. Seventy-five percent of the people like it. And it turned his whole presidency around overnight. It was like, I'm no longer the liberal. I'm the Bill Clinton triangulating. I'll move to the middle. And the minute he did it, his ratings started going up. And as of the latest poll this week, he's got a 48% approval rating, 41% disapproval. And if you ask most political people, 
of which you are one. So if there was a George Galloway in the United States mm. who could look at things as you would objectively, most people objectively would say the odds are that Obama will be reelected in two years. I, I think Republicans will win a, a lot of seats in the Senate and House, and, and that's a different thing. But yeah. for President um, Obama, I think, will be reelected as of today. But, you know, you never know. Of course, happen. a week's a long time in, in politics. Yeah. What about the Republican race to actually be the challenger to Obama? How's that Let's, going? That's one of the reasons I think Obama's favored probably to win, because the Republicans have nobody... Uh, nobody's standing out. Nobody's capturing the attention of the Republican and conservative party. And as I touched on with you when we were on together like a month ago, the, the big story inside it here is inside the Republican Party and now in the House of Representatives is a huge fight between the Republican establishment, that's the guys that have been there a long time, yep. and the Tea Party freshman Republicans the just, got, yeah. just got elected. And they have come to Washington hell-bent on cutting federal spending at all costs, whereas the Republican establishment has sort of become fat off of government spending like Democrats have. They've done it for years. They may not do quite as much as Democrats, but they're two peas in the same pod politically. And they've been hesitant to cut until the Tea Party guys came here and made them cut. And we are headed for some epic battles, George. In two weeks, we're going to have one on a, a thing called a continuing resolution, which has to be approved by Congress and signed by the president to keep the government running while we wait to pass a budget. Yeah. If we're not going to pass a budget by March 4th, obviously. So we always run on these CRs, they're called, continuing resolution, which just says we're going to keep spending at the same rate we're spending, right? The Republicans say, uh-uh, we're going to cut 61 or $62 billion out of this thing by March 4th. Big drastic cuts and this and that. Obama says, no, we're not going to do that. I'll veto that. And there is a real chance of a government shutdown. A good look. Yeah. And, and I don't know how much time you and I have left on this segment. But let me just say a uh, big, big thing. <clears throat> this country is going through something that it has never been through, state by state. <clears throat> state by state, <clears throat> the state budgets are on the verge of bankruptcy because of the bad economy. Mm. You know, they're hemorrhaging money for unemployment insurance to all the unemployed people, and they're taking in less tax revenue, so they're all broke. And newly elected governors, and this is both Republican and Democratic governors, George. New York's got a Democratic governor, yeah. California, and then the Republican ones, too. They are all making unbelievably huge budget cuts, including taking on public uh, employee unions yeah. and cutting their benefits. And what I'm saying is big is I think it's the first time in American history that government as an entity, both state and federal, is going to be forced to shrink. This has been the dream of the right for 50 years, mm. is, is to decrease the size of government. But it's never happened. They never do it. They talk about it. Mm. This time, the uh, economic meltdown over here is forcing it to happen. And yet, and yet, of course, the lesson of the crash in the 29 and 30s uh, is that uh, when you have such economic meltdown, if you then take uh, demand, further demand out of the economy by making more people unemployed by shrinking government, you can actually precipitate a plunge into even deeper economic problems. Absolutely. Well, I, and, and, and let me just say, the big one today is, is um, Wisconsin. I don't know how much the English media is covering what's happening in Wisconsin, but Wisconsin, for a long time, it's one of our most, generally, it's been one of our most liberal states yes. politically. Last fall, they elected a Republican governor, Republican state senate, Republican a general assembly. They're in terrible problem, uh, trouble, so they've just uh, started up a bill that will pass both the House and Senate. The governor will sign it. To, not to lay off people. It's not going to do that, so it's not going to uh, increase unemployment. What they're going to do is... They're going to take away collective bargaining rights uh, on salary 
stuff from, uh, excuse me, on non-salary things like pensions, health care, all these benefits that public service unions have. And they have better benefits in our country now, the public unions do, than private sector workers. And what the governor there has done and other governors are going to do it is they, they need to decrease the cost of the public workers, mm. not to lay them off, not to fire them, but they're getting too much. Not just salary, but they don't pay in for their retirement as much, and they don't pay in for their health care as much. Well, that's all going to be uh, controversial indeed, uh, John. We've got to stop there because it's time for the news. Indeed, it's past time for the news, but uh, it's been just fascinating hearing your take uh, on these matters. If you can still hear me, John, I'm in New York on the 15th and 16th of March next month. Let's hope we can have that long-delayed lunch together. As always, grateful to the great John Le Boutelier.